Hi, and welcome to Journey Forward with Jory Rose, where you will gain insights, tools, and inspiration to get unstuck and live your best life. Jory is a licensed marriage and family therapist with a passion for helping people cultivate awareness and authenticity so they can show up fully in all aspects of their life. And now, here's Jory. Hey everyone, it's Jory Rose. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode. So I oftentimes when I'm working with clients, I keep a little notepad nearby to write down uh, really current themes that keep coming up in my work with clients or really helpful tools or ways to reframe a situation. And it really gives me ideas of not only how to continue to help my clients, but it gives me great ideas for things to talk about in a podcast, because I know if it's going to be helpful for one person, it's going to be helpful for many. The other thing is I often find there be there is continuous themes that show up in my work. Once again, that serves as a reminder. These are things that people need to hear because the more I say it during the week, <laughs> clearly it's something that is not intuitive or even if it's common knowledge, it's not always common practice. So one of the things that I wrote down that happened to come up quite a bit recently in my work is talking about regulation. And how this is so important when it comes to conflict in our relationships. So let me first off explain what I mean by regulation and then understand why it's so important to focus on regulation rather than what seems obvious, which is to focus on solving the problem at hand in that moment. Okay, so when I talk about regulation, it's a fancy way of saying we need to calm down. And what I really mean when I say we need to calm down is we need to calm the brain and we need to calm the body. In order to understand why regulation is so important, especially during conflict, we need to revisit some of the things that I've talked about in the past around what I call brain science 101. So let's walk through some of this simple brain science to help you understand why you're doing what you're doing, and more importantly, for you to realize you are in fact human. And I love to remind my clients of their humanness because I think it helps give permission for understanding our reactions. It doesn't necessarily give permission to enact certain behaviors, but it gives us greater understanding, greater ability for self-compassion as well as compassion for others. But as if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that one of the things I am passionate about is helping people get unstuck. And I believe that one of the ways we can get unstuck is to gain greater knowledge and understanding, why the hell am I doing what I'm doing? In absence of knowing that, I stay reactive, I stay feeling out of control or not within power of how I want to show up. And then I get reinforced that I can't create change. This is just who I am. This sucks it just the way it is. While acceptance is important, it's not the thing to stop you from creating change and moving forward. Okay, so let's get to some very simple and yet important understanding of how the brain works. Like I said, if you've been listening to me, you've heard this before, but repetition is the mother of mastery and we can never get too many reminders of this valuable information. So on the top of your head, if you were to put your hand on top of your head, you would be activating, not activating, you would be um, touching the area of the part of our brain. Well, maybe not all the way touching the area because it would be internal, but you know the point. In the middle of our brain is where we've got our emotional brain. Inside there, we've got something called the amygdala. This is like a little emotional alarm. Now, if you were to put your hand on your forehead, that's the front part of our brain. This is our prefrontal cortex. It's the most evolved part of our brain. And it is where our executive functioning resides. Now, first thing is understand that this prefrontal cortex is not fully formed until our mid twenties, very late adolescence. So this helps understand why in absence of executive functioning, why it is that maybe we don't make the best choices, which is why teenagers tend to have extra risky behavior because their brain isn't fully formed to let them know that what they're doing isn't such a smart idea. But once we become adults and that prefrontal cortex is fully formed, we've got no more excuse. And I say that, of course, laughing and lovingly. 
Um, but this is where our executive functioning is. And the executive functioning is the part of our brain in which we have logic, reason, rationality, decision-making, clear thinking, language, communication, learning and retaining information, memory. So the reciprocal relationship from the emotional part of our brain to our executive functioning is when our emotional brain fires off, when that amygdala gets triggered, when that alarm starts to blare, it gets activated and it actually shuts down our executive functioning. So when you're angry, you say things you don't mean. When you're stressed, you can't think straight. When you're nervous, you forget something. When you're anxious, your mind feels fuzzy. So if you have ever experienced any of those examples that I just gave, and of course there are more, you know that your brain works, which is awesome because once again, you're human. So our executive functioning, our tools, our resources are hard to activate when that emotional brain has taken over. So if we are in a situation in which it's really an emotional, if it's conflict, if it's an argument, if it's a child who's tantruming and the emotional brain has been activated, you can't reason your way out of your emotional brain with logic and reason. Anyone who has tried to reason with a tantruming child will know this firsthand. Emotions are not logical. They come from two entirely separate parts of the brain. I just had you touch the part of your brain in which they come from. So because we know emotions aren't logical, we can't treat emotions with logic. Makes sense intuitively, but how do we put that into practice? Well, in order for us to get that executive functioning back on track, back online, back to its functioning at our optimal level, we've got to be able to calm down the emotional brain. Easier said than done, especially if we're really triggered. But here's why this, is, this matters. Here's why this is so important. If you are stuck in conflict, if you are in the midst of an argument, a disagreement, if someone is upset or hurt or angry or just simply emotional, and we come at it with that logic and reason, the other person, or perhaps you, is not going to be able to hear it. And oftentimes, when we try to come at an emotional moment with logic and reason, and it gets dismissed or denied, or there could create further conflict, we get really frustrated. And we can easily take it to a bigger picture of you know, adopting big grand narratives about this person, this relationship, this experience, whatever it is. Oftentimes when we're in the middle of conflict, we want to be able to alleviate it. So we try to look for solutions. If someone is sad, you try to make them happy. If someone is angry, you try to calm them down. If someone is anxious, you're trying to get them to settle. Remember, no one can get to that resolution until that emotional brain is calmed down. So when I say, just like I said in the beginning, the goal in conflict, in a disagreement, in an emotional challenge, in an argument, in a time when that emotional brain has taken over, of course we're wanting to get to a goal and a resolution. But I wanna advise you to be mindful to say, that is my secondary goal is to get to resolution or to fix or see if there's a solution for which I can solve this problem or this transgression or this disagreement. What people don't necessarily tune into, which is again, why I wanna reinforce this for you because it's a game changer, is to actually recognize the real goal is regulation. The real goal is to settle the emotional brain because if that emotional brain is still activated, we are not able to step towards resolution. We are not able to even hear a solution to the problem. There is nothing to fix as long as that emotional brain is still activated. 
course, this is easier said than done, but awareness is the key to creating this change, to creating a long-term habit, to creating the ability to recognize when you're stuck, you cannot move forward. And that's not your fault. That's not you or the other person being stubborn. That's not you being defiant or resistant. That is simply the challenge of our brain preventing us from accessing those tools and resources. Because when the emotional brain is not triggered, when it's not activated, when we are feeling more calm, we are much more able to access those resources. They're more available to us. It's often said that the relationship between the emotional brain and executive functioning, when the emotional brain is not triggered, that connection is like a four lane open road with no traffic whatsoever. It's like a, a freeway without traffic early in the morning, or I guess maybe the middle of the day, not commute time, and everything is flowing. But when that emotional brain takes over, the ability to access those tools, those resources that reside in the executive functioning, that four lane open road becomes like a one lane, one lane country road with traffic. It's really hard to access it. So if you can be able to momentarily pause on trying to either decrease negative behavior or immediately get to solution or resolution and realize that your primary goal is to regulate the brain. If we can calm ourselves down or help role model or guide the other person in calming down and we can regulate our nervous system then and only then can we access the tools to get to resolution. So another way of kind of deepening awareness in this is knowing that when that emotional brain gets activated, what is often happening is it activates the sympathetic nervous system, which is the part of our brain in which we feel a real or perceived threat. Right? So back in the day when we were cavemen, the threat was there was a bear in the cave, it threatened our survival. Modern day understanding of this is that if we have a thought that there might be a bear in the cave, we still get activated in the same way. So thoughts, perceptions, assumptions can activate the brain as if the threat were really real. So this goes to show why our thoughts are just so damn powerful. In absence of being aware of your thoughts, you're gonna stay stuck in that activation. But when that sympathetic nervous system gets activated in the belief that there's some threat to us, whether real or perceived, it's gonna produce a physical response in the body. But the physiological response is gonna be increased heart rate, blood boiling, tension in the neck, jaw, shoulders, pit in the stomach, clenched fists. Our blood feels like it's rushing, flowing to our external limbs. Because what it's literally doing is the brain has been designed to help us run from the bear or fight the bear. So our body responds, it's activated, we're raring to go. So if our brain has been activated, all that physiology is fired up and the other person is trying to logic and reason with us, our body is not there yet because it's still activated. What we need to do is calm the body down so we can actually hear the other person or get to our own place of center. So how do we calm down that brain once it's been activated so we can be able to feel regulated, be able to feel calm and present? Well, there's two best ways. One is to breathe and two is to name what you're experiencing, name what's arising. So when you breathe, especially if you are a parent and you are managing how to work through this with your children, they will often roll their eyes at the suggestion of taking a deep breath because it's frustrating to them because they believe it's not gonna help. Many adults feel this way as well, but in truth, when you take a deep breath, it literally is gonna activate the calming part of our brain. It's activating the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest part of the brain, which is to say, oh, okay. I thought there was a threat. I thought I was you know, needing to fight for my protection. And it turns out I'm actually safe. 
And if my brain knows that I'm safe, then my body is going to return to a place of centering, a place of calm, a place of feeling more grounded. It is only when we get to that calmer place can we go back to logic and reason and rationality, stepping us towards resolution, stepping us towards solution to whatever's going on. So as long as you are meeting emotions with logic, you're going to stay stuck, whether it's in yourself or whether it's in communication and or conflict with others. So the goal here is when things get activated, when you're in an argument, when there's emotions that have taken over, the goal is regulation. We need to calm down the brain, calm down the body. Now, how we regulate is going to sometimes take practice. So I often will talk with my clients and advise the people I work with that you've got to find a baseline of calm outside of being triggered. It's much easier to access when you've already built the muscle for it. So having the ability to take a few deep breaths when you're not overwhelmed so you can feel that baseline of feeling centered, calm, and grounded the more you can do that, which is why meditation is so powerful, the more you can do that, the easier it will become for you to access it when you really need it, when you're triggered. So here's the next level of this. So if we know that we need regulation to get to resolution, if you're in partnership, if you are in relationship, and let's say you and your partner are really struggling in this moment, whose job is it to get to regulation? Now, sometimes we can have our partner help get us to regulate. We can have them remind us, hey, you're calm, or you can calm down. It's okay. I'm right here. Let's take a few deep breaths. I'm not going anywhere. This isn't going to cause a huge long-term fight. We're just in a disagreement. So having someone else help regulate you can be really helpful. The only way that person can help regulate you though is if they're already calm. If they're yelling at you to calm down, that is not gonna regulate your brain. That's not gonna help you step towards connection and resolution. So if you are in this relationship and you wanna be able to help the other person regulate, be mindful that you've gotta have the ability to regulate yourself. But sometimes it's not always the other person's job to regulate us. Oftentimes it's an internal job. Now, if you're talking to a child, you're going to have to be the role model for that regulation. But for you, this is your work. It's to say, when I get really overwhelmed, what can I do to calm myself down? Because if I act out towards others, just because I'm stressed, angry, overwhelmed, frustrated, irritable, while well, it makes sense that I'm acting out because I understand that that's just my brain doing what my brain does, it's still your responsibility to be more kind and to maybe perhaps be more mindful and aware of your actions and behaviors and the implications of those. So we can't just say, oh, that's my brain. It's not my fault. It is, you know, I can't do anything about it. While it may not be your fault, it is your responsibility to have the awareness and how to shift out of that negative reactions because that's not going to serve yourself or others, especially in partnership. So regulation is key. And, you know, if we can turn to others to help us regulate, so it maybe is a vulnerable thing to say to someone, hey, I'm really stressed, I'm really overwhelmed, can you help me? And I think that's a beautiful, very self-compassionate act to reach out to others in awareness of what you need. But that also could be really hard. So understand that there's a lot of ways that we can go about doing this. Maybe it's as simple as taking a pause. Maybe it's going for a walk. Maybe it's getting a breath of fresh air. Maybe it's shifting into a different activity for the moment. Maybe it's exercise. Maybe it's, you know, maybe you're hungry. Maybe it's getting some food or some, some water. But as long as you're trying to fix and solve the problem, when the emotional brain is activated, you're going to stay stuck. You're going to stay triggered. You're not going to step towards resolution. It's going to stay in conflict and disconnection in the relationship. And it's likely going to build a narrative of, I can't do this. Or why, why do me and this other person always argue? Or how come when I yell at my kids to calm down, they're just not calming down? 
we actually have to step into and embody a regulated self so we can help role model that to others. And in fact, one of the ways that I talk about this is, you know, when I'm talking with parents is I talk about this as being the 911 operator. And if you were having an emergency and you called 911, and if the other person on the receiving end of your call freaked out in reaction to your emergency with a higher or even equal level of intensity in which you called, you would freak out. But that 911 operator who is designed to stay calm, their whole job is to get you to regulate. Because once you can calm down, you can see more clearly the steps you need to take through this emergency. So be the 911 operator. This is the, your reminder. You've got to regulate yourself and you can also role model to others how to regulate as well. If you are trying to fix and solve a problem when the emotions have taken over, it's a futile attempt. So I hope that this has been helpful for you. I know it's a reminder of some previous things that I've talked about in other episodes, but again, repetition is the mother of mastery. We've got to hear these things in multiple ways to understand why it's important, why it matters, and most importantly, to understand our own behavior for the very goal of deepening connection in our relationships to ourselves and with others. So as long as you are activated and when you are triggered, when you are overwhelmed, you cannot step towards resolution, solving the problem, or even connection as much at that point. The goal is regulation, calming down the brain, calming down the body, getting our tools back online so we can access them to more clearly step through this challenge. A very tactical thing might be to have the awareness to even say, you know what? I'm really activated right now. I need to take a few minutes to calm myself down so I can come back to this conversation at a later point when I can actually communicate more effectively. Or you can name that for somebody else. Remember to say it with the correct tone of voice so not to activate them further, but to acknowledge compassionately, wow, it really seems like maybe we're not in the space at the moment to be able to talk about this. How about we take a few moments so we can calm ourselves down and try coming back together and talking about this in a few moments. So the goal is regulation and then you can solve the problem. I hope that you guys found this tip helpful. Uh, thanks you so much for tuning in. And as always, if this episode spoke to you, I would love a rating or a review so we can help more people journey forward to living more fulfilling, connected and happier lives in whatever that means and looks like to you. And I would also love to know your feedback. So shoot me a message on social media, on my Instagram at Joy Rose or on Facebook, and let me know what this episode meant to you. And if you get the chance to put these tools into use. Thank you so much for tuning in. Take care and be well. To continue your journey forward, find Joy Rose on Facebook and Instagram to become part of her growing community. You can also gain access to her meditations, books, online classes, or to sign up for an upcoming retreat, visit her at joryrose.com. That's J-O-R-E-E-R-O-S-E dot -E -E com.